You heard it right here, right down from the beach. The new ivory is manifest. What do you guys want to know? I can, I've done way too much research on dinosaurs. <laughs> Almost a larger than life figure. Uh, no reason at all to think it was made by aliens. Drop down and go swimming as fast as you can. Oh, well. All these big giants, you may kiss and tell them they don't. The crowd, just the pot, the loudest, the excite, the electricity. I don't know if I can take your little Canadian destroyer. The future is scary, but it's also wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for the newest episode of the Unscriptify podcast where genuine meets uncensored, powered by Jägermeister. We are joined by best-selling, adventure-telling, uh, telling Eisner-winning uh, comic book writer Ryan Orr. He wrote The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, Fantastic Four, Adventure Time. But you all must probably know him for every topic in the universe except chicken sight. Ryan, thanks for joining us and are you ready to go genuine uncensored and unscripted with us today? Yes, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, uh, and we are glad that you that, that you uh, took your time to be here with us and everything. And let's kick off this interview with your origin story. How and why you became a writer? Was it a path that you that you began in your childhood reading comics or something along the way? Yeah, I took a weird path to it. I was uh, big into computers. I learned to read on a computer, which was weird at the time, pretty normal now, I guess. Yeah. And I lived in a small town in Ontario in Canada where there wasn't a common bookstore at all. But I always kind of liked com I like the idea of comics, I think. I like the idea of you know, I knew who Superman and Batman were through like cultural osmosis, but I didn't really know much beyond that. And I graduated high school and went to university and got a job. And that's something I had disposable income in a car for the first time. So with my first paycheck, I walked into a comic book store in Ottawa. I just grabbed books at random. I grabbed uh, three books. One of them was Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. It's a great book. One of them was uh, Superman Peace on Earth by Paul Dini and Alex Ross. A great book. And the third one, I forget it was no good. But like two to three, randomly on the ground of myself is amazing. And so I was big with that. I kept reading them. I kept buying comics at random, sort of giving myself a education in indie comics and mainstream comics and alternative comics. And then in my last year of university, I started a web comic called Dinosaur Comics that I still do to this day. Mm -hmm. It's the same pictures with different words. It's better than it sounds. And <laughs> that was sort of how I took a step sideways into writing. I was doing it online. And I did a graduate degree again in computer science. I'm still a computer guy all through this. And only when I graduated uh, grad school did I sort of face this choice of like, do I go and get a job, which is what my parents wanted me to do. I have, you know, all these years of education. Or do I try to do the webcomic thing? And to become a full-time web cartoonist, I just had to fail to get a job, which is really easy. I just didn't apply anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I kept doing the webcomic. Uh, I still do, but I did it for about 10 years before someone else hired me to write for them. So it's a very long, very indirect process to, you know, like mm. writing a Squirrel Girl or Fantastic Four. But the advantage of doing it that way is I spent a decade with these same six pictures. And so with visuals that you can't change, your only option is to get good at writing everything else because you're stuck with those dinosaurs. And I think that's helped me a lot in... Um, Writing characters, writing dialogue, writing voice. I think sort of I've trained that muscle pretty well through that process. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you are one of the pioneers of uh, web comics with Dinosaur Comics, which you mentioned, and with your background in computer science and everything. How did the online space look like uh, back then? Because audience mentality was probably different on the internet. And did you expect for this web comic? that it will achieve what it achieved uh, in the meantime? Not at all. I had no expectations. Uh, when I started, I only knew of one other person putting comics online. It was Chris Onstad's Aquit. So I thought, oh, I'll be the second guy doing comics. Which was not, I was nowhere near to the second guy, but that's what I felt like. Um, <laughs> and the internet was a uh, different and I would say better place back then. It was less centralized, less controlled, uh, far less corporate people visited individual websites where now you you know the, the joke is there's five websites filled with screenshots of the other four people sought out what they wanted to read they weren't 
being mediated through an algorithmic feed and everything was a lot less commercial. Like I, I sold t-shirts. I still do. I sell merchandise, but you weren't sharing links in that commercial space. You weren't able to retweet or pay for retweets or all this stuff that sort of distorts normal human interaction. So I do feel like it was a different internet. I feel like starting today, I'm not sure what I would do. I was trying to start a web comic today because all the options have these compromises that sort of take what you're doing and distort it. So it's, it's kind of a bleak answer. I'm sorry. I feel like, um, the internet has become a lot more corporate and that's been to the disadvantage of most individual and indie creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Corporate asylum. Uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for just not to harp with this too much, but at the time I could put up a comic if you'd like to come back to see the comic the next day to keep this in the website, build a relationship that way. These days you're often putting stuff on social media where you're trying to have the comic go viral. And if the comic goes viral, you read it, you go, ha, and you like it or retweet it or whatever, but you don't necessarily, it's very hard to get a reader to seek you out next time. You're only as good as your last comic. It's very hard for the relationship or tell a longer story or do comics that aren't fitting into that four panel grid of Instagram. And so it distorts what people do online that leads towards this explosion of like relatable comics and things that have a very broad audience, something against that, but it does limit what you can do in the form when you're tied to the restrictions of the distribution medium that tightly. Mm -hmm. How many do you think readers of your f couple of first pay, uh, chapters of dinosaurs are still your readers of, of, of it today? It's funny because I had the 21st, uh, 22nd, 21st anniversary uh, just recently, February 1st. And I got emails from people being like, I've been reading since the early days. One gentleman wrote me and said he used a dinosaur comic in his online dating profile way back when, and it got him a date and now they're married and have a kid. So there's like living humans in the world that I'm partially responsible for. So it's, you don't know how you work for <laughs> someone, but that is a fascinating way that it's affected, uh, the world we all share. There's people in it partially because of me. I mean, I'd do any of the hard work. I'd just put a comic online, but it spins <laughs> up from there. <laughs> There would be a problem if you did some hard work with his wife, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, you pointed out in some of your interviews, uh, general appeal for superheroes, either as movie genre or comics or costume for, uh, Halloween idols, inspirations, etc. But can you share your thoughts about it? This, this affection for superheroes in every sphere of our life today, but. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting. I think there's nothing wrong with superheroes. Like I love that they are aspirational. I love that they're entertaining. I love that as a kid, I cared only about their powers. I felt like, why would anyone love a superhero beyond Superman? Cause he's got the most powers. So he's clearly the best superhero. And then as I grew up, I got more interested in the personalities and the characters start realizing, oh, like there's these stories are about something. These stories have themes and meaning. And the thing that is uh, so beautiful about superhero stories is that they let you operate on this almost uh, mythic level where in a normal story, you can't really have the embodiment of good come up against the embodiment of evil and then fight to see which is best. But you can have someone like Captain America or, or Superman do that and have these ideas explored on a higher, almost symbolic plane. It's sounds heady and boring, but then you realize these are just like brightly colored characters punching each other and laser visiting each other. It's exciting too. So it, it combines these, the high and the low art in uh, really fascinating ways. And, you know, writing Squirrel Girl, where her whole thing was uh, nonviolent solutions to problems and empathy and understanding her villains and why they want to fight her and how she helped them. That too felt like you were operating on this, this larger stage and getting to explore this type of conflict resolution that normally isn't seen in the genre, but worked really well. Like I love her yeah. read. I love how she could turn her enemies into half allies. But you broke uh, the internet when she defeated Thanos. 
Oh, she defeated Thanos before my time. She was already breaking it before I even showed up. Mm-hmm. Well, you, 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 but then that's the thing also. Uh, when when I had a uh, squiddle girl, uh, this wasn't, I wasn't familiar with the character uh, before, obviously. So your version now of the character is the one that I will always associate with. Uh, do you think, like you talk about that, obviously it's a, uh, it's a part of the comic book lore. We we get the hero and we get the villain and they resolve resolve that problem uh, with the fight and uh, that's usually how it goes. Do you think that uh, there uh, there might be a change going forward with that? You know that uh, maybe superhero comics go in some other way as you try the Skrull Girl. I think superhero comics are always changing, which is on one hand kind of crazy crazy thing to say about a genre that's been around for so long but they in my opinion they tend to reflect the things that we're concerned about and i don't think in you know 1940 there'd be a lot of demand for a superhero like squirrel girl then because she sort of plays within the larger universe and she bounces off expectations of this whole world around her that makes her click but as the medium and the genre expands, people get a more nuanced view of conflict and problems and like, does punching someone until they stop doing crime actually solve anything? Like that sort of, uh, these questions become more interesting and more relevant. So I think the, the medium is, or the genre is changing all the time. There's always fresh stuff happening. That's just a superhero comics and comics in general. It's such a young medium. The thing I love about comics is that I can pick up a comic routinely and see something done that I haven't seen done before in the medium. And it's almost routine, but it's so exceptional. The only other medium like that I know of is video games, where that medium is also very young. And you can play a video game. Like a great video game is fun, that has a great story, but it also usually does something that is new. And that has not been done before. And you know, you don't see that in novels because we're pretty familiar with what text on a page can do and where some quotations are and how far we push it. But we don't know those answers with comics. We don't know those answers with video games. And that for me is exciting. And part of why comics is changing so much is that it's still exploring the space and finding out what it's good at, what it does well, what are, what are the surprises there. Mm, yeah, but that's probably also because comics are multidimensional because again, novels are only words on the paper, and here you have drawing, and you know obviously words. You don't have sound with video games. You have sound even. So there's part of that as well. Yeah, yeah, there's great. I mean, the, it's one of the most basic things of comics that I love is when a character is telling you one thing in words, and the pictures are like he's lying to you, and this is the truth. <laughs> it's so fun. Uh, let me connect uh, on all of that because how do you approach uh, those already established characters because there are debates uh, that revolves around your storytelling style of your humor and unique style while others uh, have it tough to accept uh, not just yours but everybody uh, when he brings uh, new light to the character and not everything needs to be aligned with traditional expectations of superheroes. How do you approach that? Yeah, uh, that's a, a great and deep question. Um, with Squirrel Girl, when I came on with her, I could read every Squirrel Girl comic that had ever been published. There were only a handful of them. And then see what I liked, see what resonated, and sort of rebuild her from the ground up to become this more modern version of the character. Um, with something like Fantastic Four, that's a much more challenging thing because these are characters that have been around since before I've been alive, been around since the 60s. And there are people who have been reading every Fantastic Four comic since the 60s that are still around reading them. And so in a very real sense, it's kind of ridiculous for me to say I have any more claim to the character than those fans that have been reading this character for so long. And yet... I have to write this book. And so how do you approach that? How do you do that? And the way yeah, I found more of a Fantastic Four is to uh, read them and again, sort of see what resonated, what did I like, what's the 
to me the cleanest, purest version of these characters. And I went for a lot of walks talking to myself, but on these headphones, so it looks like I'm an important person on a call and I'm just talking to myself and I'm trying to figure out like, what are their voices? What are they like? I also structured the book to give me the best chance of doing that, where the teen breaks up at the start and we have a just read and, uh, or a just bed and a least issue and then a just read and sue issue, then a just study storm issue. Three whole months, each of the characters before I come together to, to be a teen. But at the end of the day, um, all you can do is hope that your stories resonate, that what you're doing connects with people. Because comics come to some of the deaths for any Marvel comic, but DC too, um, in these love running series, Comics Community is a is a strange thing where we all agree that the stories we don't like don't really matter. They don't get referenced again, they just sort of fade away. The stories we love come back and get referenced and become part of the canon. And so, well, in theory, every story since 1960 has counted for Fantastic Four. In practice, there's stuff that was introduced and then disappeared, never came back again. And there's stuff that was introduced and became core to who these people are. And so all you can really do is hope that the stories you tell uh, contribute to that core, that people like them and remember them and recall them in the future. And I think going any further than that, you just go crazy trying to connect everything and make sure that there's no possible contradictions. All you can do is like hope that this story works for today and carries on what they've been doing in a reasonable way. Does that make any mm -hmm. sense? But, but do you uh, maybe sometimes approach your writing, like like you said, uh, Fantastic Four is here uh, even before you were born, from the 60s. It's, it's the team that built Marvel Comics, basically, uh, when Stanley yeah. invented them. And it's still actual, The uh, it's still trending, let's say, uh, and all of those uh, stuff. And do you look at your stories like something that will be readable, that, uh, uh, that the reader uh, will be able to connect with, understand in, let's say, 50 or 60 years. I mean, I hope so. But you can't, I don't know, you can, you can, you can build for that. You can't know what the future is going to be like. And you can't, I think it's a mistake to try to write for an imagined audience in the future. If you try to write something timeless, that tends to shave off a lot of the edges of it and make it more generic because you're trying to appeal to a larger group of imaginary people that don't exist yet. But if you try to write to the current people, people who are alive right now, you can be specific and you can still talk about larger themes that are timeless. Like what is, what is justice? What is rightness? What does it mean to be alive? But I think the best stories I've read are still situated in a real moment than has timeless. Like you look at Shakespeare, the great example of like timeless stories. His stories all take place in history times when he was alive or before even. And so there's all these specific stuff that no longer connect to modern audiences, but what he's doing still connects. And I feel like that's the the only way forward is to try to write for people today and hope that it resonates with a few years, but you can't bet on it. Yeah, yeah. I heard a lot of writers uh, uh, talking about their writing process like I'm not writing for anybody else. I'm writing something that I will like. I write for myself. If I like it, it's good to me and probably to a lot of people. Not to everybody, but good enough. That's the hope. Exactly. Uh, same thing. I did an interview once with my student paper when I was an undergrad. I just graduated uh, school. And I said the same thing. I said, you know, we're talking about comedy. And I said, well, I'm writing for anyone who shares my sense of humor. And that's all you can do. But when it... <laughs> reach print they printed it as uh i'm writing for anyone who has a sense of humor which is a way more egotistical thing to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah you didn't sound very well at that <laughs> uh, the, the, you mentioned uh continuity and how you look at continuity with obviously some stories fade away that uh don't click and some that click are timeless uh, we, we discuss continuity here uh, with uh, other guests such as Mar Wolfman and uh, Dan Waters uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they had a differing opinions. Do you find oh. continuity something that, you know, limits you or is it all the same to you? It can do both. I mean, there are times where you want to tell a story. I had this happen both ways in Squirrel Girl. There's a time where I wanted to tell a story with a certain character. And that character was dead. 
And so I can't do this story because the character is dead right now. So Tom Doty says, no, think of something else. There were other times, there was a Squirrel Girl arc where I wanted to have her team up with Dr. Strange. And my editor... But, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, let me stop you. Who is the character? Because you can always relive them in comedy. <laughs> uh, Thanos was dead at the time. I didn't... <laughs> it felt bad to bring him back and to kill him again. So it didn't, it didn't fit. It didn't make sense. <laughs> But this other example, I wanted Squirrel Girl to keep up with Doctor Strange, and my editor, Will, Ma Will Moss, said, uh, just so you know, at this time, uh, Doctor Strange is going to be Loki. Loki will be Sorcerer Supreme. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's so much better. Squirrel Girl's going to team up with Loki. Like, let's do that story instead. So their continuity was elevating what I wanted to mm -hmm. do. And there's been tied towards neutral. There was one series where I wanted Squirrel Girl to beat up Captain America, and I got the note that by the time this book comes out, Captain America will have a super soldier serum sucked out of him. It'll just be an old man with no powers. And I was like, wow, Squirrel Girl beating up an old man with no powers feels kind of mean. And then I got the note that, you all, you know, even without his powers, Steve Rogers is a trained military man and he, the physical condition is 80 years old. I was like, fine, she'll beat him up. So she beat up an old man with no powers. That's <laughs> <laughs> so sort of the neutral continuity path. So it, mm -hmm. it can help, it can hinder, it can do sort of the middle. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. And mm -hmm. It, as a writer, it sucks when a great idea you have can't be used because a character is dead or in space. But mm -hmm. the the other side is sometimes it gives you some really great stuff you would never have thought of otherwise that lets mm -hmm. you go in different directions. So it's a complicated beast in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Is is Power Pack such a story because you wrote it as almost a tie into the Outlaw? Is that the name of the event uh, in the battle? Yes. Uh, yeah. You you wrote as a you know complementary to that uh, what was happening in the universe at the time yeah that was sort of a neutral one where we wanted to do a power pack comic and that gave us a nice excuse to do it and it tied in the the event prompted the comic but if you were not following the event you could still pick up the power pack comic and understand what's happening why we're doing this stuff and, and take it from there yeah I, well, I didn't know about the event but I read the comic and, yeah you know I didn't <laughs> but I just realized that it's connected to something <laughs> yeah I think that's I'm a big fan of comics being accessible so that you can pick up a book and not be lost. And I'm glad in your case, that's how it worked, where you picked up a book and you didn't know the larger context, but you're like, well, I, I know what I need to know. I can still enjoy this. I don't feel like I'm missing anything. And I'll tell you the first comic I remember reading, <clears throat> I got a Wonder Woman comic in my stocking from Santa when I was a kid. And I was so excited because this is my first comic book. And it was like part three of nine. And I would completely <laughs> lost the whole book. We didn't do recaps <laughs> in those days. It was just like walking into a movie after it's been 45 minutes running and then leaving <laughs> five minutes later and saying, wow, what was that? So I always try to like ensure that if every comic is someone's first comic and if you're picking out this comic cold, you are not lost. You can still enjoy this unit of story. Especially with Fantastic mm -hmm. Four, we've been doing these uh, shorter one or two issue comics where if it's a one issue story, you're good to go. We'll tell you who the Fantastic Four are on the intro page and then please enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's the other side of the perspective uh, uh, regarding the, the the continuity for fans, for readers, because uh, the, the whole concept is that you tie, especially Marvel and DC are doing this. Uh, uh, they connect all small stories into big crossover event that must happen once or twice a year. And there are a bunch of tie-ins that lead just to that story. And maybe so will it, so maybe somebody will pick that story, uh, that comic book as his first one and he will be completely lost. And that that and even if you start reading from issue one, from volume one, it's leading to different story. And you like read the story without the end and similar stuff I, uh, yeah i mean important to to nail it to like make sure that it works and i feel like the industry is changing a bit in that I've, the past couple of events that i've looked at and we had squirrel girl tie into war of the realms event at the time and i felt like that worked well where you could read squirrel girl on your own and not be lost through that journey mm -hmm. or if you're just reading war of the realms you could hop into squirrel girl and get the other part of the story like that's the i think that's the the dragon we're all chasing we want it to be that seamless and that natural and that clicking together um and the worst the bad version of what you describe where it feels like your book suddenly changes its focus for three issues or 
you know, I don't understand why this is happening. And mm-hmm. I feel like in the past we expected, well, you know, fans will just have to go out and buy 10 more comics that they want to understand. And now it's more like, well, let's respect the fan and be like, if you're just reading this book, you can continue mm-hmm. just reading this book. But if you want more, it's there for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when I read uh, the, the last crossover that I read was Devon Ray. And you could uh, read it completely fine without uh, der- even Daredevil storyline by Chip Zdarsky or anything. And before that, I read The Judgment Day, which is Avengers, X-Men, Eternals crossover. And if you didn't mm-hmm. read anything that happened before that, you were completely out of place especially regarding millions of details that you do not understand. So yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's not a solved problem where we're all trying to do the best we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I get it. I get that. Like I love it when a detail from the past clicks into place. I think the mm-hmm. challenge is it has to click into place in a way that's so satisfying for long-term readers who've read it all. And it also yeah. doesn't leave new readers lost. And that is, yeah. those are two different directions. You have to square that circle somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that you will understand uh, as a writer better than uh, we will. It's special to writer to put some detail to, to reflect his uh, past run or uh, somebody that he admires in his books yeah. and these references. Yeah. Because if you think like me, that continuity is a shared consensus of what stories are important. You're putting a little finger on the scale for the stories you love. Like, yeah, I'm bringing this back, or this thing is there. It mattered. It's important. It's still there. Mm-hmm. And tell me, uh, you won uh, two Eisner Awards in uh, right to uh, in your career. Uh, how did that uh, affect your career as a comic book writer? Because when it's Oscar for comic books, and when you win Oscar for movies, you're a big deal. How does it feel for you <laughs> in, in this industry? Um, I will say the thing that worked out really nicely for me is that the first monthly book I did was Adventure Time, and that was nominated uh, for an Eisner a bunch of times. And the first thing it was off it one. And so I got to win the first time I was nominated, which was just great. I felt like, great. I covered that so I don't need to worry about that anymore there's people <laughs> incredibly talented people who have been nominated for Eisner's a bunch of times and never won mm-hmm. and in that case I feel like that would drive me crazy I'd be like do I not deserve this am I bad am I secretly bad but it's <laughs> it was a, a great twist of faith that I got to have it first was nominated just maybe like relax about it so it's, it's hard for me to tell because I did get those that recognition um so early in what I was doing how I would have done differently but I also believe, and this is always sounds insincere because I have won these awards, but I feel like honestly, the real honor has been being nominated because that's the part that is the curated people be like, no, we think this is work worth recognizing here. And the award itself is, is voting is a popularity contest, but the nomination is the, is the coolest part. But the other card is that like talking to editors. I don't think any of them consider what awards you've won when they're looking to to cast you on a book. They're, they've read your work and they like it and they want to see more of that. So I don't necessarily feel like it is something you need to have or even something that is a huge advantage. It's just, I call it a mm-hmm. comics prize. <laughs> sort of belittle myself. Like, yeah, I got a comics prize. It's nice. I like it. I'm flattered. Um, but I don't, I couldn't tell you which of my colleagues have officers or don't have officers. And that doesn't enter into my calculation when I'm talking to them of like, <laughs> should I be afraid of this person because they're so fancy? Like it's, it's just, <laughs> it's a side thing, which is nice. I don't want to belittle the award, but I also, I don't want to say like, you need it to do anything because you don't. Well, let me ask you this then, because you maybe have the insight of this as person from the industry. Uh, since Eisner's are like Oscars for comic books, there are movies especially made for the Oscar season. Are there comics especially made for Eisner <laughs> season? Oh, that's, that's interesting. I've yeah, I've never thought I've questioned. Um, I feel like when I watch a movie that's Oscar bait, you're like, oh, this is Oscar bait. There's a lot of crying or whatever. There's a lot of big important feelings. 
Um, I don't think so. I feel like when I've read comics and I'm like, this book deserves an Eisner, it's because it's doing something exceptional. I think part of the advantage we have over movies in the industry is that there are so many people. You can make a lot of money in movies. You can make, you can get rich in movies. You can become a millionaire being an actor or being a writer in movies. That doesn't necessarily apply in comics. There's much less money in comics. And there's few to no people who enter comics thinking, this is how I'm going to get rich. So why do you make comics? Because you like comics. Because you love the medium. You want to tell the story in this medium. And by removing that get rich quick instead of... Um, I think it produces better work. Everyone who's in here is in here because they want to be there and they're excited about what they can do. Um, I think that sort of removes some of the, you don't get Eisner bait comics the way you get Oscar bait movies because the stakes are lower and the motivations are more, I guess to say pure, more artistic. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, passion could be uh, could be sensed in some way when you see on uh, Comic Con and other conventions where the whole community breeds, eats, uh, uh, and just yeah. lives comics. <laughs> there are no rules but one: drink Jägermeister at minus eighteen degrees Celsius. Now, right now, obviously, we touched upon uh, a little bit about uh, the movies, Oscar baits, and all that. Uh, uh, simple question I I, I I i must think that that thought ran through your mind uh your works being adapted to the to the big screen did you ever uh, not only that but did you ever think about maybe you writing for a film or tv series that does that cross your mind as a obviously author and storyteller yeah yeah it's something i've worked at um it's i've written scripts i've adapted work uh the challenge is that there are, you know, millions of books published each year and hundreds of thousands of comics. And there are, what, maybe a hundred big movies, maybe a hundred TV shows, Plus. if that, every year, less. And so it's much, much harder to get something through all those gauntlets. Um, it's something I really enjoy. I've enjoyed writing these scripts. I've enjoyed how in a screenplay the focus is largely on the dialogue, which is where I'm most at home. Um, but it's nothing that we've managed to get all the way to the, to the finish line yet. So mm -hmm. there's some cool scripts that no one will see that I've written. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you're a versatile writer. Uh, you wrote how to take over the world. And that's basically, I, I didn't have a chance to, to read it, but it, as I you saw some, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I saw some reviews. It's basically a guideline for every aspiring supervillain, but it's also a, a lesson uh, for superheroes to save the day. And what lesson is your favorite in that one? Yeah, so that book is, uh, it does what it says in the tin. It's a guide of how to pull off these supervillain schemes, but they're all in the real world. So there's no shrink rays, there's no mind control helmets, but with actual physics, science, and technology, uh, how close can we get to a, you know, floating base? How can we blow up the internet? Like all these, these, how do we ensure that our messages, that our message to the world is never forgotten? And there's all these plots in the book that I've, I've worked through the actual science technology. I've priced them all out for a little over $56 billion. You can do every single plot in the book, which is surprisingly <laughs> affordable. There's like 18 people on earth who have that much personal wealth who should do it today, which is a little concerning. Um, <laughs> my favorite chapter of the book is the one about ensuring your message is never forgotten. You're super going to do everything, but how do you ensure that future generations remember you? And so we look at it on a logarithmic or a, a logarithmic scale. We look at it at one year, 10 year, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, all the way up to effectively the heat death of the universe. And the challenges in sending information across those gulfs of time uh, are fascinating. You start dealing with the issues of language because language evolves, but also humans evolve, humanity evolves. Uh, if you're trying to talk to an intelligence, a million years in the future, how do you establish a shared baseline for communication? What can you possibly say to them? 
So it, it mm -hmm. starts in this like really selfish place of, I want to ensure that I'm never forgotten. And it ends up touching upon these really kind of mind expanding questions of like what communication is and what an idea is and how we can possibly understand another's mind and all this stuff mm -hmm. flows from that. And what I love about the book is that it starts with such a fun premise and such a relatable premise. Like, yeah, I wish I was the boss. I want to have on the bookshelf beside me, behind me, a book that says how to take over the world. What a cool prof. But also it's <laughs> like it's real and it's uh, inspiring and moving, I think. It was a sequel to the book I wrote called How to Bet Everything, which yeah. is a similar premise of like you go back in time and your time machine breaks and this manual tells you, well, you can't fix your time machine, but here's how you rebuild the technological mm -hmm. civilization from scratch. And that whole thing of like, it's a fun premise, but it's also real. You can learn how to build civilization from this book is what excites me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a reading premise for it, it reminded me of Dr. Stone and Senku story. How do you do uh, research for uh, a book like How to Invent Everything? Because uh, there's a lot of scientific stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you read a ton. There's a ton of research. But you need to understand about papers. It. Yeah, but the nice thing is, uh, the way I divide up how to bet everything, I built the technology tree for real life. If you have this technology leads to this technology, here are your prerequisites. And so what I produced was a list of the technologies you need. And so while the problem of how do you rebuild so that civilization from scratch is huge and colossal, the implementation is, all right, well, how can you build a screw from scratch? How do you get the spiral on a screw? How do you do uh, water purification? How do you build a forge that'll unlock steel, that'll unlock better ovens? Like all this stuff becomes smaller problems. And I remember, you know, I'd spend a couple days just working on latitude and longitude. And once I have that, We've got navigation. What's book for navigation? We need clocks. So we need really good clocks. How do you do timekeeping? And the fun thing about the timekeeping thing is that it was a real problem we had in real life. How do we have accurate clocks on a boat? They're moving. How do we fix this? And the answer in real life was really, really complicated clocks. But then we invented radio waves. Or we didn't invent them. We discovered radio waves. And then you can just send out a timekeeping signal. So you can leapfrog all this unnecessary clock development and just go to radio. And then you've got navigation. So it's, it was a lot of researching individual technologies and then just basically writing a fun and funny essay about it and connecting them all together. I really enjoyed it. It was, uh, it felt like it was getting away with something right in that book that we got to have all this fun and get a book at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh how do you, well, I'm jumping from team to team now. Uh, how do you balance, uh, between humor and serious storytelling in your studies? But there's not a lot of seriousness in your <laughs> problem. Like, there is something <laughs> what you read. <laughs> I mean, from what and what you read, I read. I mean, they're pretty lighthearted and fun. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you there was a time in my life where I was writing Squirrel Girl and also working on the graphic novel adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, which is a black humor, but like serious war book about World War Two. And initially I was like, all right, I'm going to do uh Sonic House five in the morning and squirrel girl in the afternoon. And I started to write squirrel. I'm like, why do I feel like everything is pointless and sad? Like I just not through world war two. This isn't working. So I started dividing like, I have a Sonic House five day and a, a squirrel girl day. But to answer your question, um, I feel like humor is something that is I was going to say human, but animals have a sense of humor too. But it, it, it feels, makes things feel real. A humor of this character to me is uninteresting. And so even in a comic like Fantastic Four, where it's sci-fi adventure, not comedy, Human Torch, Johnny Storm is still a funny guy. <laughs> he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he tells jokes. He sometimes not in on the jokes at his own expense. He's a goof. He's uh, not an idiot, but compared to the geniuses around him, he's just a regular guy. Like he's funny. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a character be funny in a serious story and have it still work. And I always like to have that moment of humanity. So it's not just scientists sitting around in a circle discussing a problem. It's actual people who are like, well, this is crazy. <laughs> like, let's, let's just do what we can to survive. But like, 
there's jokes to be made here. This is this is something that we're getting through together, and it'll be easier for telling or keeping each other's spirits up. So it's a balance. Uh, book by Squirrel Girl is obviously a comedy, all ages book. A book like The Death has less humor in it, but I don't think I've ever written anything that is completely devoid of humor. Uh, even like Star Wars Five, it's black comedy, but there are some heartbreaking uh, jokes in there. They're jokes, mm-hmm. but they're bleak. I mean, Bonnie is great. Yeah, uh, Im- imagine a situation where you meet a uh, not yet fan, and you want to inspire him or motivate him to start your comic. Which one would you choose to recommend to him, and how would you sell it to him? You know, I've had this at uh, shows at conventions where a parent comes up and says, what book should I get for this person? And my first question is always, well, what tell me about this person. Yeah, like, give your six-year-old Slaughterhouse Five. <laughs> but I'll ask, like, well, what do they like? Do they like comedy? Do they like adventure? How old are they? What are their interests? Um, Filters. Because I've written all over the spectrum. I've written picture books for kids. I've written these nonfiction books that are also with the fictional candy coating and have jokes in them. I've written everything and so it depends on the person i i would hope that you know you can put any one of my books in anyone's hands and their peoples will become little hearts and they're like this is great but the reality is you try to find the right book for the right reader at the right time that's what librarians mm-hmm. do and the way to do that is to know the person you're recommending the book to so it, it depends per person there's no one book where i'm like this has everything i want to say in it and will give you the perfect experience because that's going to change at age six or 16 or 66. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, 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 that's fair. And, uh, but obviously you, you spoke about, uh, uh, comedy and, uh, seriousness and mixing those two. Uh, I personally think that comedy is one of the toughest genres to pull up. Uh, one of the reasons, because I, I could name you right now, a hundred great drama movies. But if you ask me for 10 great comedies that came out last 10 years, I would have a, I would struggle to name them. Uh, in, in your mind, is comedy because, is that, if you agree with that, that comedy is hard to pull up, is that because we have all our individual sense of humor that sometimes obviously compares with other, or is it just because it's hard to be funny guy? <laughs> so... It's funny because I spent most of my career being like, well, comedy is easy and drama is hard because my natural inclinations were to comedy. And I always thought I was kind of like skating by, kind of cheating, writing all this comedy stuff. And then I saw an interview with uh, my friend Chip Zdarsky and he was saying, similar to what you were just saying, that, you know, I can write a scene that is sad and will make you cry. And everyone who reads it will cry. And I can write a scene to make you laugh and one in 10 people will think that's funny. It's so much harder to do comedy. And I was like, oh, I've been doing this on hard mode <laughs> for the past 20 years. <laughs> I've all this comedy. What is this? Um, I think it's true that uh, comedy is hard. That we have different senses of humor. And also, comedy ages very quickly. Um, mm-hmm. You can look back to critically acclaimed comedies of the 1960s and just be stone-faced throughout the whole thing and be like, this is broad and goofy and does not scan anymore and that's within living human memory Uh, i remember reading a bunch of ancient greek uh comedy and being like this is this is comedy in theory i guess but i'm not laughing then i found one ancient greek joke that uh did make me laugh so there's still some jokes that survive but it's harder which one okay uh Hopefully you'll find this funny. There was a uh, man named Hippocletes, and he had this daughter. And the daughter uh, was caught the eye of the king. And the king was like, I'm going to marry this daughter. And Hippocletes was like, this is great. Let's give us a lot of money. Our family set. And then at the wedding ceremony, uh, Hippocletes gets super drunk. He's doing like the ancient Greek equivalent of like the lampshade on his head. He's really embarrassing himself. And people are like, Hippocletes, sit down. You're ruining this. And the joke goes, uh, Hippocletes replied, Hippocletes doesn't care. Hence the famous expression, Hippocletes doesn't care. <laughs> and I was like, what a good... that's not an expression. That's amazing. <laughs> the famous expression, Hippocletes doesn't care. I love it. Wow. <laughs> so, man, 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 give me a word. Your mileage may vary. 
Uh, are, are you familiar with, did you maybe ever read Franz Kafka? I've read um, The Metamorphosis, so I've read the hits, but not, not a bunch of it. Uh, yeah, for uh, today, uh, in a lot of ways, people, when they say Kafkaesque, you know, they, they think of this bleak style, maybe kind of depressive and gothic about Kafka. Uh, the but, the, but, the, but the thing is, uh, there are accounts of him reading his books to his friends, and at the time they were laughing their asses off. Uh, they were meant as almost uh, these funny novels uh, at the time, but it's interesting that now that we read them, they're almost like this uh, bleak, uh, kind of philosophically gothic books. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's crazy how quickly uh, opinions change and mm -hmm. responses to where change. So our grandsons will be will enjoy. Classic, like American Pie or Mid the Mid the Parent. <laughs> no, the not American Pie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A serious story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I have one uh, final question for me. And is there a comic book uh, superhero you would like to write in the theater? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. There are, but. The thing is, I didn't know who Squirrel Girl was when I started writing her. I got the email saying, give us a pitch for Squirrel Girl. And I was like, is she the one with Squirrel Powers? I know nothing about her. And then I spent the weekend reading about her. And at the end of that weekend, I realized two things. I really wanted to be a Squirrel Girl comic. I wanted to be the guy writing her because I, I fell in love with this character. It's the same with any of them. Like I can, you know, like Green Lantern or like Batman. I don't have a Green Lantern or Batman pitch, and I won't until I sit down as if I am going to write it and think about these characters and what excites me and what connects me. It's actually through a Fantastic Four. Like, I knew the Fantastic Four. I'd read Fantastic Four comics. But when Tom Brevoort asked me to pitch on the book, that's when I started thinking about Fantastic Four for the first time. Like, is this something? Mm -hmm. What in this excites me? What in this makes me want to hang out with these people more? So... All this to say, I feel like it's basic with basically any character. That's the process. You may have never heard of them or you might have read the comics for years, but I don't think I have a pitch for any of them until I sit down and actually do the work. So mm -hmm. I don't have a list of characters I'd like to hit. Um, I have a list of characters where if someone asks me, I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I know that person. Unless if someone asks me, be like, I don't know that comic. I need to read some more. But there's not... Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a bucket list or anything. I enjoy them as they come. Yeah, but uh, are you doing a hard work right now, pitching some idea? Yeah, I can't tell you anything about it, but I can't tell you. <laughs> Spoilers! Um, I am uh, hard at work working uh, with the team at uh, Motive EA on their Iron Man game coming out. And that's been oh, fun yeah. because that is uh, Iron Man, who's a guy like and we get to dive deep into the character because it's a game. There's a lot more space in a comic book. And it's working with the team. And the team is terrific. So it's mm. it's a different process, but it's one I've really been enjoying. And it's nice to sort of... Everything you do is creative. I say this as a guy who studies computer science. Um, even programming a computer is a creative act. But they're different types of creativity. And sitting alone at a desk writing a comic book is a different experience than working in a group on a story for a video game. And it's nice to be able to sort of flex those different muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 perhaps the final one for me as well. Uh, you know, I've asked this, uh, all the comic book writers that were here, and I got some great recommendations, and that's why I ask. Uh, is, uh, what do you cons if you would name one, maybe multiple ones, what do you consider perfect comic book, in your opinion? Oh Something you read? comic wow Oof. Um, I'm biased because I mentioned this at the start so we're doing a callback but this is one of the first comics I read and it is the Superman Peace on Earth book by Paul Dini and Alex Ross so the reason I'm recommending this book is because it's oversized like a picture book everything is painted 
And the story it tells is a Superman story. It's a Superman story where he sits down and says, I'm Superman. I can do anything. I guess I'll, why can't I solve world hunger? I'm going to go solve world hunger. And he tries and fails to do this. And for me, what blew my mind at the time was I knew Superman as the guy who, you know, punched Brainiac. And they did, you could tell this serious story of him trying to solve a real issue and failing blew my mind. But also it's such a well-told sympathetic human story of a guy trying to do something hard and failing at it and having to deal with that and recover from that and find hope in failure. And for me, I think that feeling of reading that story and realizing there's so much more to what I thought comics were. There's so much more that this medium can do. That feeling, I think, has sustained a whole career. <laughs> so there may be flaws in that book. I cannot see them. I think it is a perfect comic. Superman, Peace on Earth, Paul Dini, and Alan Ross. We'll check it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll check it out. Uh, yeah. Before we wrap up, we have a little tradition we say a quote or anecdote in our language and translate it to English and Luca has quote prepared for this episode uh, yeah I prepared quotes from uh, Oscar Davicho who was a uh, Yugoslav uh, poet and a surrealist poet uh, on our language uh, he said drugo je mržnja ona je refleks kao odbrana da ljubav ne dolazi sama od sebe kao ni pismo kao ni poklon treba da postoji neko ko šalje te dragocjenosti ili otkriti u čemu je ljepota ta, o to onoga što voliš i drugo, to je teško. Uh, and on English it would translate to Hatred is one thing, it is a reflex, as a defense. Uh, but love does not come by itself, nor a letter, nor a gift. There must be someone sending those valuables, but discovering what the beauty of what you love is another thing, it's difficult. That's great. I love that. Yeah, uh, maybe it will serve as this inspiration in some of the future storylines. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was really a fun and enjoyable. Yeah, we enjoyed it. See you. We stay genuine, uncensored, and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Iguzo! <laughs>